What was once seen as a complex game only for the analytical minded has suddenly risen in popularity in mainstream media. Famous online personalities and renowned chess players have been pumping out chess related content and have been competing in various tournaments online for hundreds and thousands of people to watch. Despite the sudden upbringing of the game, my interest began a few years prior, back when my cousin first challenged me to a chess game with his brand new chessboard. What started as an innocent hobby spiraled into countless hours sunk into watching professional matches, learning new strategies, and placing bets on matches. I decided to make a chess program to pay homage to the memorable experiences the game has created in my life and to challenge myself and see if I could truly build such a complex program to finish off the class. Without any further ado, I'd like to share my journey towards building a chess program in Python. After learning about frames and using TK inter commands in loops and functions, I was able to create an 8x8 checkerboard with each square as a button. A tough decision I had to make was to think of how the players would choose what pieces to move and how I would move the pieces. I came up with two options. I could have the buttons I made store the images of the pieces and be the player's method of selecting them, or I could track their cursor location and clicks to find out what pieces they have selected, and move pictures of pieces to different coordinates depending on their move. I figured buttons were easier, since the players could then use the button as an input, rather than have to check cursor location in relation to a window. Today, I plan to create dictionaries that would help the program arrange the starting positions of all pieces. After two hours, I managed to upload the pictures onto the program, but when I tried applying it to the buttons, they just shrank, didn't respond when clicked, and didn't even display the picture. I decided to just take a break and work on it the next day. I had to study for and take a math test as well as study for finals, so I wanted to take a break for this day. After searching around on Stack Overflow, I managed to find my solution. After setting the config of the button, I also needed to set the image of the button to the picture. Yeah, I, I don't really get it, but it, it works? <laughs> now, I just need to think of an efficient way to set each button with the correct image, and then I can finally get into the fun stuff, movement and the actual game itself. By the end of the day, I was able to place all the pieces on the board. I managed to only allow pieces to move if the desired square was allowed by their moveset. The only problem is that they can move wherever and can even self-destruct. Hmm. To counteract this, I made a function that would check whether the move would be valid, and made use of an if statement depending on the piece to see if the location they were trying to move to would be possible regarding their movement. Next, I kept track of the amount of turns and used that variable to determine whose turn it was. I gave white the option to move during even number turns, and black for odd number turns. From there, I placed an if statement before the whole piece movement process to make sure that these regulations took place. I quickly went and allowed pawns to capture opposing pieces on the diagonals, which wasn't too hard. Next, I began working on further improving the piece movement by creating a function that checked to see whether a piece's destination already had a piece with its own color and prevented the move from happening if there was. Now, it was time to prevent pieces from jumping across hella pieces just like this. Here? Yeah. Okay. GG. <laughs> Wait a minute! <laughs> Wait a minute! <laughs> I had already managed to prevent pieces from moving if their destination had a piece of their own color already on the square, but I have nothing to check for their trip to that square since the piece just teleports. As tedious as it may sound, I was thinking of creating a for loop that would check the squares in between each square. If I had made the pieces their own individual objects, I could have easily calculated this, but if I were to change that, I would have to rework almost all of my code. After a few minutes of troubleshooting, I managed to implement my previous idea into my code. I've only done it with the rook's vertical movement since calculating loops for straight movements would be easier than diagonal movements like the bishops, so now I just need to find out how to do the latter. By the end of my coding session, I managed to fix the movement of the rook. Since the knight can jump, the king can only move one square, and pawn movement has already been set, I'll just have the queen's and the bishop's movement to restrict, and after that, movement should be completely finished. I struggled a lot on trying to check the squares of the diagonals, but after my entire work period for today, I managed to solve it. 
I ended up creating four versions of checking, depending on whether it was traveling northwest, northeast, southwest, or southeast. From then, I would set the X and Y values accordingly, and would increase the file and rank values at the same time to incorporate the diagonal checking. Initially, I used the for loop to check X and Y, but that ended up making the program check more than Y values for every X values. Now all that's left is promotion, castling, and the check system. I spent around 30 minutes on the promotion menu, but just wanted to relax for the day. I had an integral test today for calculus, a chem test Thursday, and have been doing this daily for over a week. I managed to have the piece change to the corresponding button that was clicked, but for some reason, players weren't allowed to move their pieces after. I tried destroying the main loop, but what worked was making the select piece function nested in the promotion menu function, which allowed me to delete the promo route. With that done, all I need to do is castling and the check system, and make this video you're watching of course. And so, the quest to get a properly working chess system began. Luckily, I was able to utilize my previous methods of determining whether a piece was able to move to the desired square. To see if the king was in check, I iterated through all the squares, checking the opposite colored pieces to see if they were able to attack the king. There was a bit of confusion with replacing the pictures and knowing when to initiate the check, but after some trial and error, I was able to sort it out. Since both the squares selected by the players and the movement system use the same variables, running the movement system to look for checks would replace the user selections and not run as intended. To combat this, I stored the user selected values in some makeshift values and set it back after the check function did its thing. I would check whether the king was in check after the move was made, and if it was in check as a result of the move, or if it was already in check in the first place, the move would be reverted. There were some bugs due to me having to change the square 1 and square 2 values for the iteration to occur, but it was all sorted out in the end. Now I'm at the final stretch. All I have to do is add in castling and the game will be 100% complete. To allow the user to castle, I would check to see if they tried to move their king 2 to the left or 2 to the right from the default spot, which is how you would request a castle in an online chess engine. Right here is the code. I called a function and checked to see if it was true. In the function, I used if statements to make sure that the king or the rook it wants to castle with hasn't already moved in the game, and then proceeded to check if the squares in between were open. If the requirements were met, I would allow castle. After 20 hours of mentally draining coding and troubleshooting, I finally did everything I seek to do in this Python program. Along the way I've conquered plenty of difficult problems, learned a lot more than if I were to make an easier program, and really screwed myself for finals by spending too much time working on this instead. I already went over some parts of the program during my daily journaling, but this will be more of a thorough rundown of all the code and functions. Even though there are areas for improvement, I'm really proud of myself for creating a complex program considering my prior experience and knowledge. First, I imported tkinter for my UI, string to have access to an organized alphabet string, os and sys to retrieve the images of the pieces of the files, and pil to help with displaying images on the UI. All my functions are stored under a single frame class, and at the bottom, I created a root for the window and ran the functions to create the board. Import pieces and set pieces. Import pieces retrieves all the files of the images for the pieces and stores them as Python images. Set pieces prepares the board by setting the images of the square buttons as their corresponding starting pieces while filling the rest of the board with blank images. The constructor method for the class contains a lot of variables that are accessible to the functions within the board class. Hopefully, the comments and names of the variables should be enough to help you understand what they're for. Set squares uses for loops to create buttons and pair them into a dictionary with their corresponding position on the board. When pressed, these buttons call the select piece function, which is where all the fun begins. So, let's run through a game and see how the program aids the progression of a match. To move the pieces, you first click on the first button of the piece you want to move, then the button of the square you wish to move it to. Each square button, when clicked, runs the select piece function, which first checks to see whose turn it is. As you can see, I can't move a black piece, since white always has the first move in a game. To do this, I created a variable to store the number of turns played so far, and let white move when the number is even, and black move when the number is odd. For a move to happen, the piece selected must be the same color as whoever has the turn. If I select the pawn on d2 as my first square, it runs this line of code, which stores the position and button of the square, and increases the variable self buttons pressed by 1. 
When I select the second square, the position and button of the square is stored once again. If the second square is the same as the first, it sets the button's press to zero and reverts the first selection you made, making it useful if you want to deselect a piece. Let's select the pawn on e2 instead and move it to e4. Since the two squares are different this time, the program then runs the functions allowed piece move and friendly fire in an if statement to see whether the move is allowed. Allowed piece move finds out what piece is displayed on the first square selected and checks to see if that piece is allowed to move to the second square by triggering piece specific if statements. For example, to evaluate whether a king was allowed to move to the second square, I would check and see if the change in rank and file of the two squares selected was less than two. In this case, a pawn is allowed to move forward two squares if they are still in their starting position, and if there is no piece directly in front of them, so the function returns true. For pieces that must have a clear path to their destination, the function clear path is called with the kind of piece as the argument. From there, I use for loops and if statements to individually check and see if each square on the path is empty. If so, the function returns false. Looking back at the if statement, both conditions are satisfied, so the inner code runs. Before moving the piece, the current square 1 and square 2 values are stored in temporary variables to prepare for the check function that's about to change them. The image displayed on the second square is then changed to the first square's image, and the first square's image becomes blank. After, an if statement is used to see if the king is in check. This checks not only if the king was in check at the beginning of the turn, but also after the move was made. In the inCheck function, the previous values are stored to be replaced after the function has finished doing its thing. Next, it uses a for loop to check if the opposing color's pieces have a chance at capturing the king on the next move. This is done by setting the first square to every opponent piece and the second square as the king's current position which is found by iterating through all the buttons to see where the king is. Finally, it runs the allowed piece move function for each square with an opponent's piece. As soon as it realizes that a piece can capture the king, the function returns true. If not, the function restores the square 1 and square 2 values to the ones that were selected by the user and returns false. In this case, incheck would return false so the pieces won't revert back to their previous positions, which would have been the case if it returned true. Now the move has been successfully displayed, and what's left are some if statements to see if the king and rooks have moved to help with the castling function, as well as an if statement to see if a pawn is eligible for a promotion. I'll demonstrate those two functions in a bit as the game progresses. Since it's black's turn, I do the same move I did for white. To show that the check system is working, I move my light square bishop to b5, pinning the pawn on d7. As you can see, I can't move the pawn since the in check function would return negative or false and run code to revert the move. Instead, I'll move my pawn to c6, attacking the bishop. Next, I'll develop my knight to f3, allowing white to castle on their next move. The black pawn takes the bishop, and then white castles. Let's run through the castle function. The castle function is called in the allowed piece move function and is triggered when the king moves forward at either of these squares. If the king or rook it wants to castle with hasn't moved, it then checks to see if the squares in between the two pieces are clear. If so, the function moves the rook to the proper square and the king is given permission to move two spaces. Lastly, let's go over the pawn promotion process. If a pawn manages to get all the way to the other side of the board, the if statement for pawn promotion will be triggered and the function will run. Then, a menu pops up letting the player choose what piece it should promote to. This is done by creating a new TK into root with buttons for each possible piece. When pressed, the return piece function is called, which changes the pawn image to the requested piece that is the same color as the pawn. So that's about it. In regards to how my program has changed over time, I don't really think it has. There were no major shifts in my code, and if anything, I was simply adding onto my foundation of already existing code, like how the movement system is integral to my check system. Despite the excessive amount of time I've spent creating this program and editing this video, I don't really regret any second of it. It was a very hands-on learning process, and it helped me see what it was like to tackle complex problems with little guidance. Instead of copying a YouTube video barely understanding what is being done, I was able to overcome even the toughest of tribulations and reap the rewards in the form of a working program I can call my own. Lastly, I would like to say thanks to Mr. Knight for all the help throughout the class and for thinking I could do this in the first place, the people on Stack Overflow who helped me learn new coding techniques, and you for watching the video. Consider liking if you enjoyed. And if you want to see more videos about my life like this, be sure to subscribe.